the increased interest in classical Russian literature and history of 19th century Russia was accompanied by several historical costume dramas, recreating the exquisite customs of the nobility and igniting a certain nostalgia for a bygone era. The portrayal of the Russian imperial army and cinema varied from film to film. In Two Comrades Were Serving, a tragic drama about the battle for Crimea, the plot revolves around two Red Army soldiers, the cool and quiet Nekrasov and the easily agitated Karyakin, who work together forming an experimental aerial reconnaissance team. Captured behind enemy lines, they narrowly avoid death just to be almost executed by their own troops. Parallel to their story, the viewer sees the retreat of the White Army across Crimea through the eyes of Brusensov, a White Army officer. The Whites put up a desperate last stand to slow the Red advance, but for Brusensov, the war is over, and he only wishes to get himself and his trusty stallion out of the country. The Flight, based on the play by Mikhail Bulgakov, is similar in its depiction of the white immigrants escaping Crimea, but unlike the two comrades, the flight is presented completely from the viewpoint of the losing side. During the final days of the Crimean resistance, several characters deal with the inevitable end in their own ways. Ruthless General Hludov understands that all is lost, but remains brutal in his actions. Another white general, Charnota, spends his time gambling and drinking. The generals, along with the trade minister, his estranged wife, and a junior professor, all manage to escape to Constantinople, where a life of poverty awaits them. In his surreal dreams, Hludov sees the thousands of men he killed. Every day he stands on the shore, looking in the direction of his homeland, and knowing that he can never return. The original play was banned personally by Joseph Stalin for portraying the White Army in a sympathetic light, but the film barely managed to avoid censorship. Mikhail Bulgakov personally witnessed the tumultuous events of 1918 from his apartment in central Kiev. His novel, The White Guard, contains a detailed account of those times and was adapted into a three-part television film titled The Days of the Turbines. With the Great War over, the German army abandons their occupation of Ukraine and only a small garrison of Russian imperial troops is left to guard the capital. In the middle of the chaos, three siblings, Alexei, Nikolai and Yelena, ponder their future knowing that the city is about to fall. The Turbins, closely based on Bulgakov's real-life relatives, undergo the same despair and confusion as he must have experienced in those uncertain days. With the spy film craze of the 1960s, espionage stories were made in every possible setting. Yevgeny Tashkov, the director of a popular World War II spy miniseries, made an even more successful series about the Russian Civil War. The Adjutant of His Excellency, a five-episode television miniseries, follows Pavel Kaltsov, a captain of the White Army and a spy for the Reds. Kaltsov gets a job as the adjutant of a general, a position with access to important documents and secret meetings. Colonel Shukin, the director of white counterintelligence, suspects a mole in their midst and starts an investigation, even as Kaltsov begins dating his daughter. Unusually for the time, most of the white army officers were shown as intelligent, educated, patriotic, honorable, 
and generally quite likable individuals. The Russian Civil War was a politically sensitive topic even for the well-established directors, and even more so for the risk-taking filmmaker Gennady Poloka. Already in poor standing for ignoring censorship officials in the past, Poloka adapted The Intervention, a play by Lev Savin. Instead of using any of the approved and traditional approaches to the topic, Poloka's film is a grotesque stage musical a parade of bright colors, abstract decorations, and theatrical costumes. The story takes place in Odessa, just as the forces of Triple Entente arrive to support the White Army. Comrade Brodsky, an underground revolutionary, is recruiting people into the resistance, dealing with an eclectic group of characters, an aristocratic woman, her naive son, an enthusiastic flower girl, and the local gangsters. Poloka gathered an ensemble cast and even many of the smaller roles were played by veteran actors. The unusual approach to a sensitive topic did not please the powers that be. The film was banned from release for the vague reason of, quote, serious ideological mistakes and even ordered to be destroyed. The director himself secretly saved a copy and the audiences had to wait two decades to finally see it in 1987. Poloka's career slowly recovered after the fiasco with the intervention, but fellow director Alexander Askoilov had a less fortunate fate. The Commissar, a civil war drama with very little actual war, stars Nona Mordukova as Klavdia Vavilova, a stern Red Army Commissar. Pregnant and about to give birth, Klavdia leaves the front line and forcefully moves in with a poor Jewish family. Unwelcoming at first, her new neighbors warm up to her and help her give birth to a boy. Klavdia begins a new life as a mother temporarily forgetting about the ongoing war. But as the White Army approaches, shelling the small Ukrainian town, Klavdia's motherly instincts conflict with her duty as a soldier. Innovative as it was, the film was not allowed to be released until the late 80s, and the reasons given were just as vague as those of the intervention. Perhaps it was the subject matter, depicting a Red Commissar in such a non-heroic way or the absurd hallucinations of Vavilova imagined during the birth scene. Or even the frank portrayal of an impoverished Jewish household, a culture rarely addressed in Soviet cinema. Whatever the reason, Askoldov's career as a director essentially ended with his debut work. And to understand why Askoldov chose such a controversial topic, one must look into his personal past. Ночью приняли, спрятали. Много лет спустя уже совсем взрослым человеком я в Киеве был, пытался найти этих людей. Мне сказали, что они погибли там, где погибли многие киевские евреи в 1941 году и в Бабе Миру. Так вот след их там потерялся. В нашем городе, товарищ Вавилов, никогда не будут ходить трамваи. Никогда. Почему, Ефим? потому что в них некому будет ездить. If the early films about the revolution and the Russian Civil War like to depict the events as the achievements of the Soviet people as a whole, 
than the ones from the 1960s and 70s are stories about individuals. White Son of the Desert, a drama by Vladimir Motil, is one of the most successful Easterns, that is, Soviet films with heavy influences from the Western genre. In the desert near the Caspian Sea, Comrade Suhov, a lone Red Army soldier, is on a long journey heading home to his wife. The area is not safe from Basmachi bandits, however, and Suhov is assigned an unusual final task – to guard the harem of an escaped gang leader. Fully aware that the bandits will be back in force, Suhov waits for them in an ancient seaside town. A chance encounter in the desert gains Suhov a valuable ally, and the local customs official, formerly of the Imperial Army, is willing to help a fellow soldier regardless of ideology. The desolate beauty of the film's setting was skillfully captured by director of photography Eduard Rozovsky, and composer Isaac Schwartz accompanied it with a recognizable soundtrack. The film enjoyed unexpected success at every level, from General Secretary Leonid Brezhnev to the Soviet cosmonauts, who made it their tradition to watch the film before every mission. Today, the film is still warmly remembered and often quoted. At Home Among Strangers, also known as A Friend Among Foes, A Foe Among Friends, is the directorial debut of Nikita Mikhalkov. In this Eastern, the plot revolves around a more literal treasure, a bag full of gold which needs to be delivered to Moscow. Five old friends, all members of the Cheka state security, are assigned to protect the gold, but something goes terribly wrong. The train is robbed by bandits, and the supposedly secret package is stolen by the large gang of Ataman Brilov. The Cheka searches for a traitor in their midst, while Chekist Shilov, drugged and set up as a scapegoat, tries to recollect his vague memories and find those responsible for his predicament. A mix of an action film and a detective story, the picture became another successful attempt at imitating the Western genre and established Mikhalkov as a prominent director. With many heroic adventure films set in the Russian Civil War, relatively few showed the effects of the war on contemporary arts. A Slave of Love, Mikhalkov's next film, is a self-referential story of filmmaking during the war. Somewhere in a southern resort town, a typical silent romantic film is being made. Its creators are paying little attention to the ongoing fighting elsewhere leading a leisurely life in the white-controlled territory. Actress Olga begins a relationship with cameraman Viktor and learns that the latter is an underground Red Revolutionary. Olga regards the Civil War as something distant and romantic when she is suddenly faced with the grim reality of the conflict. Supposedly inspired by the life of real actress Vera Holodnaya, the film is an interesting insight into the film industry of the revolutionary era, but has little in common with the biography of the silent film star. The war and the arts are also intertwined in Alexander Mita's Shine, Shine, My Star. In a small town, three men approach the arts in very different ways. Vladimir a stage director wants to introduce the entire world to the works of classic authors. 
Fyodor, an artist who never speaks a word, paints the inside of his house in fantastic landscapes and doesn't mind that no one but himself can see it. For Pashka, the owner of a movie theater, the arts only exist to make a profit. The three men try to stay away from politics, but the civil war has other plans and the red-controlled town is overrun by the white army. The change of the government prompts Pashka to alter the narrative of the vulgar film he is playing to be in line with the ideals of the occupiers. Vladimir reluctantly puts on a silly show for the soldiers, knowing what would happen if he doesn't. And Fyodor continues to create, ignoring the dangers of the outside world. Shine, shine my star, although nowhere as popular as other films about the Civil War, is remembered by reminding its viewers of the eternal struggle between arts and politics. Богом забытом городишке я поставлю спектакль Откровение. Мы Пашку возьмем в театр. Билеты продавать. Б почему? Почему билеты? Пашка, милый, на свете движут по жизни высокие идеи, а тебя твои кривые ножки. И правда. У меня тоже есть идея. Какая? This concludes our exploration of Soviet films set during the Russian Civil War. In the next episode, we take a look at the sad comedies of Eldar Rizanov. Join us to learn how Rizanov's films encapsulated the minute details of life in the USSR and why his works became an integral part of Soviet pop culture.